Turn with me this morning to the book of Revelation, chapter 4. Now, I'm going to do chapter 5, and after chapter 5, we're going to change directions a little bit uh, in this. We'll get back to the book of Revelation. <laughs> just for a I want to make sure we got some other things covered before that. we we'll get to the meat of Revelation. Uh, we're going to do the entire chapter of chapter 4. All, right. All 11 verses of it. Remember, he's wrote he, he's wrote a uh, a letter to seven churches of Asia, and after at the end of each of these letters, he that hath an ear, let him hear, is the refrain. In other words, if you've got an ear, you better be listening. And I have a feeling that we all have ears here, and so we need to be listening to what God's word has to say. But the transition here now is that uh, he says after these things in verse 1 in verse 1 after these things I did see and behold a door having been opened and continues to be opened in heaven and the first voice which I did hear was of a trumpet was as of a trumpet speaking with me, saying, You come up here, and I will show to you what is necessary to come to be after these things. Instantly, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne had been set in heaven, in the heaven, and while one is sitting on the throne, and the one who is sitting was like an appearance to a stone, to stone, jasper and carnelian and, and a rainbow was around the throne like in an appearance to emerald the first voice that talked to John in Revelation 1.10 now spoke to him again and that was the voice of Jesus the voice spoke loud and clear to John uh, now look I'm not sure it sounded like a trumpet, but do you know how clear and precise a trumpet can be when played well? Piercing at times. That's what the idea of his voice was. John was called up to heaven through a door standing open in heaven. Now, I'm not sure that he actually went through that door. But that door was open and he got a glimpse of what heaven looks like. In the middle of that space was a throne. The voice spoke loud and clear to John. Come up. It was kind of like the trumpet that uh, gathered the congregation of Israel together. Are gathered for an army to gather an army for battle. Something that when you heard it, you had no you had no doubt about what it was. John will be shown things that concern the future because he said what must take place after this. Not in John's present day. And I believe that Jesus will show John in the following chapters of Revelation as belonging to the future and as preceding the coming reign of Jesus on the earth. He's talking about the idea that after these things happen, these things are going to happen. There's a lot of theories, and Dan, I know you know because you've seen, you probably read about it, lots of theories about when these things are going to happen. Some to say it was happening at the time that John wrote it. Some think it's things that it happens you know, in, in, in ages. In the past. But no, he says things do come after these things come. Many see John's going... Many will see John's going up to heaven here as kind of like, like the rapture of the church 
Now bear with me for a second. John was called up to heaven by a voice that sounds like a trumpet. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, just as the church will be called up like a trumpet. You know, there's no coincidences in the Bible, okay? I'm looking forward to that trumpet. I'm looking forward to that time when I hear that trumpet. Boom. It'll be undistinct. It won't undis you will be able, you won't, <clears throat> you will not be able to misinterpret what's going on. Matter of fact, you'll be gone in a second, a half second, the blinking of an eye. All this happened before the great wrath that will be described in Revelation 6. So as that great judgment on the earth unfolded, John, who is a representative of the church, think about that. He's a representative of the church was in heaven looking down on earth. Significantly, the word church from this point forward never appears. The word ecclesia never appears in the rest of Revelation. It doesn't. John as a representative of the church is looking down upon the earth. Guys, I don't know the details, but I have a feeling that we're going to be in kind of John's place, looking down upon the earth as all the rest of the events of Revelation happens. That's what I believe. So what did John see? What was the first thing he noticed? It was that throne. Throne was what impressed John. It was the centerpiece of this vision. John was fixated upon the occupied throne. And everything else is described in relation to the throne. The bottom line of atheism or materialism is that there is no throne. That's what people want to say there is no throne. There is no seat of authority or power that the entire universe must answer to. That's what they believe. And they live their lives like it. The bottom line of humanism is that there is a throne. But man sits upon that throne. Even more people today believe that. And yet here we see the throne. And the throne is not empty. There is this one who sits on the great heavenly throne. And this throne is a powerful declaration of not merely God's presence, but of His sovereign, rightful reign. We understand that God is king because He's the one that sits on the throne. <clears throat> and it is His prerogative to judge. You know, we can't think rightly about much of anything until we settle our mind that that throne is occupied. That God sits on the throne today. You know, the last couple of years have been tough. There's been, I've heard a lot of folks say, nevertheless, God still sits on the throne. No true words can be spoken. He's still on the throne. He's still ruling and reigning. He has not abandoned us. He is still there. There is, there is here no description, though, of the divine being. But the description just points to the glory that surrounds this occupied throne. Not the person. We still don't know what God looks like. So instead of describing a, a, a specific form or figure, He... John describes emanations of glistening light in two colors, white, which may mean jasper, which jasper may mean diamond, and red, which is sardis. sardius. The throne was surrounded by a green-hued rainbow and the appearance like of an emerald. The rainbow, regardless of what people think about it today, is a reminder of God's commitment of his covenant with man. 
You know what a throne does? A throne says, you know, a, a, a promise says this. No, you think about it. A throne says this. I can do whatever I want because I rule. Okay? God's sitting on the throne, and the throne says that I am absolutely <laughs> positively the ruler of the universe, and I can command you to do whatever. <clears throat> but that promise, or that rainbow, says, I will fulfill this word to you. I will keep my promise, and I cannot do otherwise. A rainbow around the throne is a remarkable thing, showing that God will always limit Himself by His promises. When he says, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you, guess what? He means it. It's a promise. And he never will. What an awesome sight John saw. In verses 4 through 6, verse 4 says, And around the throne, 24 thrones, and on the thrones were 24 elders sitting while clothed and continues to be clothed, and white garments, and on their heads were golden crowns. And from the and from the throne is going out lightnings and rumblings and thunders and seven lamps of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, and being burned before the throne. And before the throne is a sea of glass, like as to a crystal, and in the middle of the throne. Hmm. Another picture of heaven. All right, let's get this over with. Who are the elders? <laughs> Somebody tell me who are the elders. I don't know. Uh, are they men? Are they are they heavenly creatures that God created? In Revelation five, we'll see this next week, nine through ten. The the twenty four elders sing a song of praise to Jesus, and they cried out, "For you were slain and had redeemed us." and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. In that passage, the 24 elders clearly spoke as representatives of God's people, the great company of the redeemed. They were men. Who's going to sit on those 24 thrones? I do not know. But they're going to be elders, respected, The white robes and crown of the elders seem to indicate that they're indeed human beings. In glory, of course. Therefore, they're redeemed, glorified man, men that sits enthroned <coughs> with Jesus. Oh, they're on lesser thrones. They're smaller. They're not in the middle. But for sure, their thrones nonetheless. When we say, listen guys, when we say that we can be ruling and reigning with God, it's not just hyperbole. It is the truth. He was going to take us and we're, we may not get around to be around the thrones of God, but He's going to take us and He's going to set us up to be ruling and reigning with Him. We're not just going to sit there and do nothing all the time. So we see these elders. They're joint heirs with Christ and they're reigning with Him. The lightning, the thunder, the voices, and the fire are reminiscent, reminiscent of God's presence at Mount Sinai. Reread that sometime in Exodus 19. The things going on. It's kind of reminiscent of what was going on at, around that mountain. Scared them to death. They would they communicate here the awe associated with the throne of God. There's just something about thunder and lightning that just, you know, I stand in awe. I, I mean, I don't want to be you know hit by it, but I stand in awe of it. And that deep thunder, you know how it just shakes the house. There's something because it's bigger than us. It's greater than us. And that's what is showing that God is greater than us. <clears throat> and then it's talking about the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God referred to in Revelation 1-4 and also in Isaiah 11-2. <clears throat> it 
is represented by seven burning lamps. The lamps of fire are important because the Holy Spirit is not ordinarily visible. Uh, the Spirit is not ordinarily visible, but the seven lamps are representing them. So to become visible, He represents Himself in a physical form like a dove or a <clears throat> tongue of fire. And whether or not it looks like glass, that sea in front of the throne, or is actually made of glass, It is the finest glass, crystal. At the end of verse 6, we continue on. And around the throne, ah, this is going to be fun. And around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes, in front and in back. And the first living creature is like a lion and the second living creature is like a young bull and the third living creature is having the face of a man and the fourth living creature is, is like an eagle while flying and the four living creatures each one according to themselves having six wings are you getting this picture here okay they have six wings full of eyes around and within and they are not having rest day and night while saying holy 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 lord the god the almighty who was and who is and who is coming verse 9 whenever the living creatures are giving glory honor and thanks to the one who is sitting on the throne to the one who is living into the ages of the ages. Four living creatures full of eyes. I, I want you at some point to go to Ezekiel 1. Not today. We don't have time for that. Ezekiel 1, 4 through 15, uh, 14 and 10, 10, 20 through 22. When you read those passages, passages we understand these uh, these uh, creatures to be cherubim. A spectacular angelic beings surrounding the throne of God. You, you, whether they're, I, I don't think they're ugly. I, you get this idea that they're all ugly, but I think it's spectacularly uh, brilliant. Um, Satan was once one of these high beings. According to Ezekiel 28. This is probably what somewhat of what uh, Satan looked like before his fall. The mul there are multitude of eyes indicate, indicate these living creatures. Now your King James Version will call it beast. But, that's, but they're actually the correct term is living creatures. Are not blind in instruments or robots. The way these super intelligent beings worship God reminds us that our worship must be intelligent. The number of eyes speak to their intelligence. They see all, learn all. This is not God creating a beast just so he can worship. This is a beast who worships God, or a creature that worships God because he wants to. Because he realizes that God is God and he is not. Unlike Satan and Lucifer who thought he became was God. They know, understand, have greater insight and perception than any man could. These beings of great intelligence and understanding, they live their existence to worship God. All failure to truly worship is rooted in the lack of seeing and a lack of understanding. There's something about worshiping God in this way. Wow. Boom. On our knees. Recognizing that He is the one on the throne, not us. John describes these four cherubim, and he describes them with a different face. Each one with a different face. In comparison with Ezekiel 1, 6, and 10, now this is going to blow your mind. 
<laughs> this will blow your mind. In Ezekiel 1, 6 through 10, we see that each of the cherubim have four faces. Each one have four faces. And at the moment, John, when John looked at them, there was one of each look, one of each face looking at them. I don't understand it. I can't comprehend it. And obviously John didn't know how to describe it either. <laughs> All we know is these beasts, these creatures, living creatures, were worshiping God. Constantly. And I think it's safest to say about these four that these four faces are important because they represent anima, uh, animate creation in its most essence. Now, this you can take this or leave it. There are lots of different explanations for it. This is the one I like. Well, the lion is the mightiest of all wild creatures. The young bull is the strongest of all tame creatures, and the the eagle king of all birds. And the man is the highest of God's creation. In some ways symbolizes that. I, I, but I mean, but like this, it doesn't really matter. The point is, whether they're representative of all creation, all created beings, whatever the case, they worship <clears throat> the Almighty God, the one who is wrong. The cherubim constantly repeats the phrase holy 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 God's holy nature is declared and emphasized with a three time repetition in the Hebrew <coughs> the double repeti or repetition of words adds emphasis and there's lots of times in the Old Testament you'll see they'll repeat the same thing and all they're doing is emphasizing it but if you do it a rare three fold repetition or repetition it designates the superlative, the best, and calls attention to the infinite holiness of God. Not only do they not rest. Now that's the part that we don't understand. Well, I don't think I want to be doing that all day. If that's what heaven's like, I'm not sure I want to be doing that. Well, not only do they not rest, they don't need to rest. They don't need to rest. As Revelation 1.8 says, the ancient Greek word is uh, pantophrator with the idea of the one who has his hand on everything. That's the word. That's the word. Uh, uh, make sure I get this right here. Almighty. Almighty, the, the Pentecostal, uh, the idea of the one who has his hand on everything. And it refers to God's eternal being. It's the same thought, or the same thought as the word Yahweh. The one who's everywhere. He is all. He is everything. This is not some minor God. This is not someone who men have lifted up to become God. I can assure you that if I ever become a God to people, it's because they lifted me, tried to lift me up to that position, not because I am. The only one who could be set on that throne is God, is Yahweh, the one who has his hand on everything. In verse 10 and 11. Now I want you to yeah, let's go back one, one to verse 9. Verse 9, yeah. yeah. Go, go to the next one. Just go to the next one. I have it. Okay. No, never mind. <laughs> verse 10 and 11. In verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, The 24 <laughs> elders will fall down before the one who is sitting on the throne. I've got these 24 elders, these rulers. Whoever they may be, might be you. I doubt it's me. But 24 elders will fall down before the one who is sitting on the throne. And they will bow down to the one who is living into the ages of the ages. 
and they will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive the glory, honor, and the power that you did create all things, and because of your will, they were created. So you have, you have the, the living creatures with the four faces and the six wings, the cherubims. And you have them bowing before God, saying, Holy, 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 the Lord Almighty is holy. And then the 24 elders come, and they get out of their seats. They're on their, they're on their thrones, they've got a crown. <clears throat> they get out of their seats. And they bow before the one who is sitting on the throne of God Almighty. And they say, they say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive the glory, the honor, and the power that you did create all things. And because of your will, they were created. <coughs> the worship of the 24 elders is prompted by the cherubim. And since the cherubim worship God day and night, so do the elders. Spurgeon said this one time. He said, Knowing angels should worship God should prompt our worship also. Do we have any less to praise Him for or thank Him for? Do we sing as much as the birds do? Yet what have birds to sing about compared with us? Do we sing as much as the angels do? Yet they were never redeemed by the blood of Christ. Birds of the air, should you excel me? Angels, shall you exceed me? You have done so, but I intend to emulate you day and night, night by day. Pour forth my soul in sacred song. You see, Christ didn't die for the cherubims. Christ did not die for the birds. And yet, it seems like nature sings out to God praises God. The angels praise God and worship Him. That should prompt us, just as it did the elders, to worship God, Lord God Almighty. Because we have so much more to be thankful for, to praise Him for. Because He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. <coughs> for us. 24 elders worship, which means to credit worth or give worship or worthiness to God. They credited God for their own work and reward. Everything I've done, Lord, I'm here just simply because of You. And then they cast their crown before the throne. They took the crown off. I heard that crown. I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep that crown. I earned it. They didn't. They bowed down. They put their crown. This, the crown is yours. I, I, I didn't really. It's all go to you. They recognized that their worthiness belonged to God. Not to them. There's also an allusion here to the practice of practice in the Roman Empire. The Emperor of Rome rule over many lesser kings. And these kings, there were at times, they were commanded to come before the emperor and lay their crowns at his feet to show a fealty. And uh, then he would give them back as a demonstration that their crowns, their right to rule, their victory came from him. So they'd throw their crowns on the ground showing that they, you know, they were, that he was the one, he was the true king there. And the true king would pick up the crown, give it back to him, and say, Now we understand each other. This is an allusion to the custom of prostrations in the East and the homage of petty kings acknowledging the supremacy of the emperor. Nothing else can compare with who was sitting on the throne. Our text says they cast all their crowns before the throne. There was no divided opinions in heaven. There was no sects or parties. They were in perfect harmony and sweet accord. There was no, 
not sure I want to give my throne up. I'm not sure about that. They all did it in one accord. It was perfect harmony. No schisms. So what one does, all does. All do. They cast their crowns without exception before the throne. Boy, I wish we could do that today. I wish we could all on one accord, I say, let's give it all to God. And we all just cast our thrones and our, our thrones to Him. Unfortunately, there's too many of us that want to keep that throne up, that crown on our head. We want to, we want to pretend that we are in charge. The 24 elders worshiped God because of His created power and glory. The fact that God is creator gives Him all the right to claim over everything. I made it. We're, I made it, so we're good. I'm yours. I copyrighted you. No one else can claim you. I'm, I, I can do whatever I want to. Even a potter has all rights and claims over the clay. And this reminds us that we each exist to give glory and pleasure to God. And until we do that, we will not fulfill our created purpose. It just won't happen. But it also means that we should plan ahead for that great day. You know, if you should walk into some great cathedral where they were singing, some great, you know, they were singing uh, and asked to, you know, asked to sing in the choir. Well, they'd say, okay, well, do you know the tune? Do you, do you know the song? And they would not let you join in the choir if you didn't, well, probably if you couldn't sing and if you didn't know the tune. Nor can we expect that untrained voices should be admitted into the choirs above. I'm not talking about singing. Dear, dear brothers and sisters, have you learned to cast your crowns at the Savior's feet already? Because that's what it's going to be like. That's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be worshiping God. May I suggest something? That we practice today, a little bit today, when we bow before Him in person, and cast our crowns before Him, <coughs> figuratively or literally. What I mean by that is this. If we truly want to worship God, we need to do it right here. Right now. All of heaven right now is, is, is worshiping our create, Creator. When we ourselves tend to forget who He is and what He's done for us, one day we won't. One day we will stand before the throne of God. I want you just to remember this now. We're going to stand before the throne of God. <clears throat> If you're a saved child of God, that should give you a little bit of comfort. And if you don't know Christ the Savior, that should terrify you. <laughs> it should terrify you. This throne, I can't wait to see it. Now, I will probably, I'll probably fall down and you know, start bawling or something, but I can't wait to see what John saw. I can't, I can't wait to worship and bow down and say, Holy, holy, holy. I can't wait to see. And say, You are worthy, O Lord God, to receive the glory, the power, the power. I can't wait to say. Well, what am I going to do now? Why do I have to wait? Why do I have to wait to be before the throne before it hits me that I need to worship my Lord and my Savior? I don't. And neither do you. Let us worship together today the one who sits upon the throne. And let us take that worship, apply it to our hearts and our lives, and to spread it to the lost and dying world and show just who, who he is, who he really is, who he could be. Today. As we prepare for an invitation, I don't know your heart, I don't know your life. 
I don't even know if you, you really worship me. But if in your heart, your, if your heart, you understand that true worship comes from worshiping one who is true, true, then you understand it's God. So as we stand and we sing today, would you give, would you cast your crowns before the front of His throne? Even today. <laughs> Say, Lord, everything that I am, everything that I have is yours. And I recognize this, and so I'm giving it back to you. So would you come today? Maybe you don't know Christ to save you. Would you come? Follow the leadings of the Holy Spirit and asking you to be your Savior. Maybe you're here today and you, you've stopped worshiping the true God. Would you bow before Him today and worship Him? So as we sing, this is your invitation.